Hello, everybody. Great to have the opportunity to, to present here. So thanks for including us on the program. And thanks all of you for attending. All right, so this is joint work with Semyon Malamud, who I do a lot of my machine learning research with, and one of my students at Yale, Kang Ying Zhou. I want to start with kind of thinking about our foundations, right, our upbringing. So I would describe most of us as having an upbringing that was very closely rooted in econometrics and anchored to this idea of a principle of parsimony. All right, so I'm going to allude to a couple very famous historical statisticians. Tukey is one of them here. Um, but to just show you the extent to which our training is so rooted in parsimony, I take a, a quote here from really like one of the foundational textbooks in time series analysis by Box and Jenkins, really the guys that sort of invented what we think of as modern time series analysis. And they say this is their textbook rule number one. It's literally, they have a list of rules in chapter one of their book. This is the first one. It is important in practice that we empl employ the smallest possible number of parameters for adequate representation. Right? So I bring this up because I want to think about the way that we sort of interact with research as being grounded in this way of thinking. All right. Now, I spend all of my time doing research nowadays on machine learning. And this principle really butts heads with the modern machine learning success that we have all seen and become very interested in. So just to give you an example of how parameterizations have become so massive, right? So many of you will have heard about this GPT-3 natural language processing model, an extremely powerful tool. How many parameters are in that model? 175 billion, all right? I've also written a lot of machine learning models for finance, for return prediction, and my puny little return prediction models have 30,000 or more parameters in these neural networks, all right? These are still massive parameterizations. So you might think to people that sort of come from our lineage of training, right, that this is a very profligate way to build models. It's probably very prone to overfit, and we've learned that when we're overfitting, we should expect some disastrous consequences out of sample. But this is wrong. It's absolutely wrong. The fact is, the very best models in machine learning, and I'm going to reference two key applications, image recognition and natural language processing. In these two applications, it's a very widely accepted fact in machine learning that the best models out there can exactly fit the training data and still deliver the best out of sample performance available. All right? So we have 175 billion parameters in a language model. That model exactly fits the training data. There's no error in the training data. That's still the best performing model out of sample. All right, so I have a reference here to Belkin, a very famous machine learner. There's a lot of evidence collected in the paper to support this fact. All right. So what does this say? People are using these models everywhere. They've demonstrated massive success. It seems that modern machine learning has taken this principle of parsimony and essentially turned it on its head. So what I want to talk to you about today in particular is that this is also happening in finance. All right. So a little bit about the recent development of machine learning in the finance literature. Okay, so this is a literature that I've been very active participant in. I and others that are working on this field have demonstrated what I think are large, economically significant, and reliable improvements in out-of-sample predictability for finance applications coming through the use of large, heavily parameterized models. Right? We're not talking about using GPT-3 parameterizations, but we're talking about using large and deep neural networks, for example. Right. Now, part of the reason why I wanted to write this paper was because I face a lot of skepticism when I talk to people about this work. I face skepticism from the academic community. I face skepticism from the practitioner community. And the skepticism is, in my view, rooted on what I was discussing in the previous slide, that we are all trained to favor parsimonious models. All right. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give you a theoretical justification for why we should unambiguously love large models. All right. I think about this paper as going through the process of building the case for doing financial machine learning. All right. 
I can show you results where I use a big model to forecast returns and they do well out of sample. You'll still face skeptics because the reality is those are back tests. Even if they're out of sample analyses, they're pseudo out of sample. We have, we're doing a back test. We never get real out of sample data until we wait for time to pass. Right. So I think the skepticism is justified. But the fact of the matter is we've demonstrated in a lot of different ways that that predictability is there empirically. Right. What I want to do now is complement that evidence with the theoretical predictions. The theoretical predictions are going to tell us in a very straightforward way that that improvement in performance coming from big models is exactly what you should expect to see. And I think once we have that type of perspective under our belt, we're going to start to see a lot more open-mindedness to using these big models in finance. All right. So what's the main theoretical result? What I'll show you is that in a very general setting, portfolio performance in particular, I'll focus on Sharp Ratio, but we can think about performance in other ways. Sharp Ratio is going to be generally increasing in model complexity. When I talk about complexity, I'm really thinking about how many parameters does my model have. Right? Generally increasing. It's always going up. It'll start to flatten out eventually, but you should always have as big of a model as you can work with. All right. Most of the talk is going to be focused on developing the intuition. All right, I'm not going to show you the mathematical proofs. There are an enormous number of equations in the paper. For this talk, I've tried to keep it down to like four or five equations. All right, so I'm going to focus on the intuition. Right? But once we have this intuition in place, we can start to think through a lot of the nuances of what's happening when we're doing statistics with large models. We develop that intuition from theory. And then I'll show you a very direct application in the data. That is essentially the exact empirical counterpart to the theory. And we're going to show that the patterns that get predicted by theory can be te teased out almost identically in the data. All right, so there's going to be a data component at the end of the talk. All right, so I want to jump right in. The way I'm going to do this is I want to essentially go through a thought experiment with you. All right, so here's the thought experiment. I want to think of a very realistic research project, the type of project that I might do at, say, AQR. So in this type of research project, I want to think about building predictive models. I believe that there is some true prediction function out there. So if I have the right predictor variables, and let me even go so far as to assume that I know those predictor variables. That's heroic, but it's a good starting point. Suppose I know the predictor variables that predict returns. I just don't know how they predict them. They predict through some generic prediction function, what I'm calling f here. When I start a project, I don't know what that prediction function is. But if we go back to sort of our, our training rooted in traditional econometrics, we don't really take that issue seriously. But that is sort of the first order issue when we're doing research. We don't know the true function. So what we've done historically is we just pick a functional form. And then we estimate that functional form. In this thought experiment, I want to imagine a researcher working on building a trading strategy that takes seriously the idea that they don't know the functional form. So what is that researcher going to do? They're going to say, well, if I don't know the functional form, I know that there are a lot of good mathematical ideas for approximating general functional forms. There are all kinds of approximations based on different basis functions and so forth. In fact, one of the most popular machine learning mechanisms, the neural network, is one such approximation result. We know there's this universal approximator property of neural networks. It was proved by Hal White and others like 30, 40 years ago. And what it says is that if I use a neural network and that neural network has enough parameters in it, I can get an arbitrarily approximate, uh, accurate approximation to the true prediction function. So this is a very sensible thought experiment to be going through when you're thinking about what a researcher might be doing. Okay. So how does the neural network work? Essentially what it does, and we'll go through some examples where we make this more concrete, but what a neural network always does is it takes the original predictors, what I've called G on this slide, and it feeds them through nonlinear transformations. But the set of nonlinear trans transformations is expansive. So I'm going to start, you can think of it, with a small number of predictor variables. And then from those predictor variables, I'm going to build many, many, many nonlinear transformations of them. They're all different functions of my original data. 
those nonlinear transformations that happen via the neural network give me my generic approximation to nonlinear prediction functions. Okay, so once I produce all of those nonlinear transformations, it turns out that when I go to run my empirical model, when I do the actual research with data, I'm just running a regression. So instead of running a regression of returns onto the original Gs, I'm running a regression onto what I've called S here, the signals, which are the transformed original data, and they can be very high dimensional. And if you think about graphically what this looks like, it is exactly a neural network. So the light blue dots here, these are the original predictors. And then when a neural network makes all of these nonlinear transformations of these original predictors, you get the dark blue dots. Those are the intermediate neurons, the nonlinear transformations of all the data. And the way the universal approximation theory works is that if I have enough of those dark blue neurons in my model, if I consider enough nonlinear transformations of my raw predictors, I get an arbitrarily good approximation of any prediction function. Now, what comes out the other end is a regression. Ultimately, I'm going to take my output of interest, in this case a return, and I'm going to be regressing it onto those nonlinear transformations of the raw data. It's going to be a massive regression, right? Think of it as I want thousands and thousands of those dark blue th dots. So those are going to be my ultimate predictor variables that I use to forecast returns. So that's how you should be think of, thinking of a researcher approaching a prediction problem when they take seriously the idea that they don't know the true prediction function. All right, this is a generic approach that one can take. All right, so that essentially defines the way that I'm gonna set up the problem, the way that I'm gonna derive this result, that heavy parameterization is a good thing. So I have in the background, I wanna keep it at the top, of the top of the slide here, some true model. I never get to interact with the true model. Instead, what I get to interact with is an approximating model. That approximating model uses, I'll call it P predictors. And I want to make P a very big number because that's how the theory works. If I make P big, I know I get a more and more accurate approximation of that true model that I don't know. All right, now, I'm a researcher. I live in the real world. I have a finite amount of data. The amount of data that I have is going to be capital T observations. All right. I now have to pick how big of an approximating model do I use? What should my P be? I have a fixed data budget to consume. How big should my P be? That is the problem that we're, that we're thinking about in reality. This is the problem that I'm going after theoretically. All right, well, there's a clear trade-off that happens here. You can start to conceptualize this very easily. The way we usually think about this in statistics is via a bias variance trade-off. And that's very much what's going to be at play here. When I make P very, very large, what we would expect is going to happen is that my estimates become very noisy. Why? Because eventually I'm going to have the number of observations start to look similar to or get exceeded by the number of parameters that I have in my model. If I don't have enough data to inform all of those parameters that I have to estimate, each of the parameter estimates is going to be really noisy. Then when I have those noisy parameters, I go to build a forecast out of sample, that thing's going to be very noisy. And then when I try and trade on that, I'm going to be trading on noise and I'm probably going to get some poor performance. All right, so that's the issue that we often think about trying to motivate us to try and constrain the size of the model that we look at. But we also have to recognize the benefit of using a big model. And the benefit of using the big model, you might think of it as bias reduction, it's really about getting better approximation accuracy. As I make P very, very large, I will get a better representation of the truth. And very generically, a better representation should give me more accurate forecasts out of sample, as long as I can estimate those parameters. That's the tension that's at play here. All right, so here's the researcher's question. I'm sitting at my desk, I have a model, it has P parameters in it. Should I add one more? If I add one more, it's gonna make all of my parameters more noise noisily estimated. But if I add one more, it's also gonna give me a better approximation. What's the trade-off? What should I do? Well, the theory answers this. Add that parameter, always. Always add that parameter. So what does this imply? This means 
that when you're trying to decide how large of a model you should use, you should always use the largest approximating model you can compute. All right? Your constraints should boil down to computing costs. All right. Before kind of going through the intuition for why this result holds, I want to do a little bit of background development on least squares. All right. So at the core of a neural network are these nonlinear transformations. But as I showed on the previous slide, that always ends in a regression model. It's always a least squares regression of my final output on my transformed nonlinear data. All right, so I can start to think a lot about how a big machine learning model is going to perform by just thinking about least squares regression. All right, so let's think about how OLS works. When I do OLS, I have my signal predictors, that's the S. The covariance of those shows up the denominator of my coefficient estimate, right? We know that if we have a relatively small number of parameters, P is less than T, we're going to apply OLS, and we actually have a fairly good intuition for what's going to happen there. If P is very small relative to T, we're going to be able to estimate each of those parameters pretty accurately, pretty precisely. They're not going to be very variable. Right? But as I start to increase P, and especially when P starts to get close to the number of observations I have, now OLS is going to start to behave pretty ugly. Right? In fact, you can imagine what happens when I get P exactly equal to T. Think about OLS. It's a system of equations, right? We're just solving a system of linear equations. So when P is exactly equal to T, I have as many observations as I have unknowns. So I can exactly estimate a single unique beta coefficient, but it is essentially the maximally variable beta coefficient because I only have one data point to inform each of those parameters. So when P equals T, I have a very noisy model. All right, so in a lot of statistics, especially the statistics I was trained on, we would always think about what happens as I range my parameters from P equals zero, the simplest possible model, to P equals T, the richest possible model. But that's not the richest possible model. You can estimate many more parameters than you have observations. Think about what happens when you do that. We're thinking about a system of equations. Now I have one equation for each observation, but I have more unknowns than I do equations. So what happens? I get multiple solutions. There are many betas that will satisfy that system. When I say satisfy that system, it means I exactly fit every data point. I can ask questions like, what happens when I take the number of predictors well beyond t? This is going to be critical for understanding what's going on when you use machine learning models in finance. All right? So I want to recognize a couple of aspects of how we would typically do least squares when we have more parameters than observations. The way we typically do it is we introduce some regularization. For example, I've written down the ridge estimator here. Ridge says, all right, if you have p greater than t, you're going to have an infinite number of possible betas that solve the system. But once I do ridge and I pick a particular shrinkage, I collapse that down to a unique solution. That's why we do ridge. It gives us a unique least squares estimator. What's interesting, though, is that I can think about what happens as I take that ridge penalty, which I've written as z on this slide here. If I take that ridge penalty, take the limit to 0, that's actually a well-defined and unique estimator as well. If ridge is exactly 0, that's a, we're back in the multiple solution case. But if I'm looking at the limit as z gets very, very small, so infinitesimal shrinkage, I'll still get a unique solution. That actually has a name in the stats literature. It's called ridgeless regression, right? It's like ridge, but the smallest possible ridge you could do. All right. This ridgeless regression is going to be kind of critical for getting our arms around what happens when we do regression when we have huge, huge numbers of parameters. All right. So that's my background coverage of least squares. Let's get into what this implies for finance. All right, I'm going to show you some pictures here. The pictures are going to be related to a trading strategy that uses the prediction that come from this big ridge model. All right, now I'm going to start by defining a variable here. I'm going to call it C. 
C is model complexity. It's the ratio of the number of parameters to the number of observations. When we do traditional econometrics, traditional asymptotics, we hold P fixed, we take T to infinity, C is zero. We've lived most of our econometric lives at C equals zero. What I want to do in this paper is think about ha what happens when C is greater than zero. In fact, I'm going to consider specifications where C gets massive, right? So on this slide here, these plots, C ranges from zero, a very small model, to 10, but we can take it much bigger than 10. We're going to be looking at some very complex models, models that have many more parameters than our data. All right, now, start on the top figure. And if you can see, at C equals one, there's a dotted line. That dotted line reflects kind of old econometrics versus new machine learning, right? So to the left of C equals one, that's when we keep our parameterizations controlled. We don't let them get bigger than the number of observations. And you see exactly this discussion that we had before. If I have a very small model, I'll estimate parameters accurately. They may not be the best description of the predictive relationships, but they will be precisely estimated. They will have low variance. Now, as I increase the number of parameters, I'm sort of spreading my data budget out more and more thinly across the parameters that I have to estimate. And so the variance of all of those parameters starts to go, starts to go up. And when I get to C equals one, that variance becomes explosive. That is exactly the definition of overfit. When C equals one, one observation per parameter, I exactly fit my data. That's the idea of overfit. I've exactly fit the data, and I don't think I've really captured the true relationship. So when I go out of, out of sample, I think it's gonna perform poorly. Now here is what we haven't spent a lot of time thinking about before. When I take P greater than T, so now I'm looking at the part of the graph where C is greater than one, notice that the volatility starts coming back down. Why is that? Well, it has to do with the fact that when we do ridge regression, we say there are many, many solutions out there. If P is greater than T, there are many, many solutions. Ridge says, pick the one with a small L2 norm for that beta estimate. What is an L2 norm? It's a variance. So it says there are many, many solutions that will exactly fit the data. Pick one of those solutions that has particularly low variance. That's what ridge regression does. It's actually exactly what ridgeless regression does. All right. So that means that as I make my models richer and richer, more and more heavily parameterized, I'm actually mechanically shrinking my model. Even though I might have infinitesimal ridge penalty, making the model richer implicitly regularizes my model. One way you can think about that is if I make the space of possible beta solutions bigger and bigger by having more and more parameters, I have more and more solutions to pick from. I can always pick a lower and lower variance one. And that's where the decrease in volatility comes from. All right, so now when I do this ridgeless regression in very high dimensional systems, I start to pull down the riskiness of those betas and therefore the riskiness of any trading strategy that uses those betas. All right, that's one half of the story. That's sort of the uh, variance side of the bias variance trade-off. What happens to the volatility of the trading strategy? The bias side comes from thinking about what this implies for expected returns. The story for expected returns is actually much easier because expected returns are all about model accuracy. So if I start with a model C equals zero, the expected return for my trading strategy is gonna be zero. I can't predict the data because I have an arbitrarily bad predictive model, approximating model. But as I start to increase the richness of, my, of the model, my approximating power improves and I get better and better expected out of sample predictability for returns. And in fact, this thing is strictly increasing. In the ridgeless case, it's actually weakly increasing, but it's never decreasing. So at this point, we should be extremely excited. I have a demonstration here that as I make P very, very large, I can pull down the volatility of a trading strategy without hindering and maybe even with helping 
my expected return. So what are we going to do? We're going to take the ratio of these two plots, because we care a lot about that object. That's the sharp ratio. And when you take the ratio of those two plots, you get this picture. And this is exactly the re result that I alluded to at the beginning. As I increase C, very generically, the sharp ratio of my trading strategy. This is my expected out of sample sharp ratio. The theory is very careful about it. These are expected out of sample objects. My expected out of sample sharp ratio is increasing in model complexity. All right. Now, this is coming from the fact, again, that a bigger model has a better expected return because it's a better approximator of the true predictive function. It also has a lower variance because it's regularized. It's regularized via this idea that we're gonna s select particular beta solutions that are low variance. All right, so as a result, we get this, this sharp ratio. Okay, so at this point, we've essentially gone through the main theoretical analysis of the paper. The key theorem in the paper says complexity is a virtue. Approximation benefits dominate the costs of heavy parameterization. So when you're an analyst and you're sitting at your desk and you ask, should I add that one additional parameter? The answer is, if you can compute it, you should absolutely add it. It's unambiguous. All right. Now, I've taken you through some pictures. I've tried to explain the intuition. I want to emphasize that the paper is theory heavy. It provides a general and rigorous statement for how we get to these proofs. All right. The plots that I've shown you, they're calculated from the proofs. They're calculated under a particular calibration that matches essentially what US return data looks like. The volatilities, the expected predictive relationships that we have. All right. Okay, so now I wanna to turn to the empirical analysis. I'm gonna analyze exact empirical analogs to the theory plots that I produced here. So in order to do this, I'm gonna focus on forecasting the US market return. And the predictors that I'm going to use, I want to make this as accessible to everybody as I can. So I'm using like the core data set when people think about return prediction. Crisp, monthly market return, and the predictors are about 15 different Goyal, Welch, macro finance predictor variables. All right. Now, in order to draw pictures, remember I have to vary my model from a small number of parameters to a very large number of parameters. In order to do that, I don't wanna just like pick the first variable and then add the second and add the third. I sort of wanna have all of the variables on an apples to apples basis. Well, that's exactly what a neural network does. When I take my 15 Goyal Welch predictors and produce a bunch of nonlinear transformations of them, in some sense, all of those nonlinear transformations are ex ante identical. What goes on inside a neural network is it takes these little blue dots the original Goyal Welch data, and in a very democratic way, allocates predictive ability to, let's say, 10,000 of the dark blue dots. It makes many, many nonlinear transformations, but it doesn't favor one nonlinear transformation over the other. It's the last step of the model, the regression step, that's going to figure out which should be favored. We're going to estimate the predictors that should be favored. All right, so once I do this, I can actually draw plots with varying C and look at how my empirical model does. When C is zero, it's like I'll have one dark blue node. As I increase C, it's like I'm just expanding the number of intermediate nonlinear features that I'm producing. So that's how I'm gonna draw the data pictures. All right, now when I do the data analysis, I'm gonna do something that sounds a little bit crazy. I'm gonna estimate my model in rolling 12-month windows. I have 15 predictors, I have 12 observations every time that I run a regression. All right. Now, I'm gonna use those 12 observations, but I'm gonna estimate models with thousands and thousands of parameters. I'm gonna make C massive in some of these specifications. Right? I'm gonna push model complexity above 1,000 in some of my specifications. All right, let me just show you what these pictures look like. First, panel A shows the out of sample expected return that you get when predicting the market return from the 15 Goyal Welch predictors. If you start from a neural network with essentially zero or one node and expand that to a neural network with as many as 12,000 nodes. So you've generated 12,000 nonlinear regressors. 
out of sample, on average, you see exactly, by the way, the dotted line at one here is still in this picture. It might be hard to see. It's very close to the y-axis because the complexity that I'm using in the empirical analysis can get so high. That's, by the way, why I picked t equals 12, so that I can make my complex models really big, right? It would make my complexity high without me having to do so much computation. All right. The volatility pattern, again, looks the same. Blows up at c equals 1 and drops back down when I have very large models. And as a result, the sharp ratio pattern that we see is exactly in line with theory. As I increase model complexity, the realized out of sample sharp ratio increases. All right. I can tell you more about the details of the estimation strategy, um, but I'm going to skip ahead to my conclusions. I'm low on time. I want to point out a couple things. First, what I've taken you through here is an application to forecasting the market return. There are obviously lots of extensions that we can immediately consider. I'm going to tell you right now, we have a lot of research that demonstrates these patterns that I just showed you for forecasting the market. They hold in every asset class we've looked at, currencies, bonds, commodities, and so forth. It also holds in cross-sectional problems. What I've shown you now has been a pure time series problem. And a cross-sectional problem, if I use these large models to predict the cross-section of stock returns, you see similar patterns as well. And then we also have some extensions where we take these one-layer neural network models and ex extend them to deeper models. All right, now in terms of conclusions, here's what I want you to walk away from the talk with. Asset pricing as an academic discipline, asset management, they're both in the midst of an ML boom. Right? What we seek to do here is provide some rigorous theoretical insight into what we should expect from ML models. And we get some interesting results that are contrary to conventional wisdom. Higher complexity always improves model performance. Right? So we've stated this as the virtue of complexity. I want to kind of qualify my statement for people that want to use this, which is to say this is not a license to throw nonsense predictors into a model. You don't get predictive benefits from putting crap in as predictors. What it does say is if you have a set of plausible predictors, the way you should use them is to produce a very high dimensional nonlinear representation of them, and then use those nonlinear transformations as your predictors. If you do that, you should expect to see improvements of performance of your trading strategy, especially if you accompany this by a little bit of shrinkage. The last conclusion that I want to emphasize is that I've, I've told you this clashes with the idea of the principle of parsimony, OK? So I want to come back to another statistician who's been very influential for how we do statistical modeling for finance, Box himself, as in George Box from Box Jenkins. He has two quotes. The first one we hear all the time. It says, all models are wrong, but some are useful. A second quote of Box's is very interesting related to this project here says that since all models are wrong, a scientist can't expect to build a correct one by excessive elaboration. That's kind of exactly what the approximation theory tells you you should do, though. And he'd say, on the contrary, following Occam's razor, what you should do is try and find the smallest model you could build. This is how we derive this principle of parsimony in the first place. Well, I don't think we should be paying attention to Occam's razor in light of these results. Not in this context. These results say if you don't know what the true model is, the best thing you can do is use the largest possible model. So I have to give credit to my boss, Cliff Asnes. When I showed him this paper and he read it, he said, you've got to call this paper Occam's Blunder. I think it's a very compelling question. If it's true that you can generically do better by increasing the size of your model when your model's misspecified, and all models are misspecified, Box tells us this right away, sort of implies that we should always be using these large models. So I'm going to leave you with that thought. Be very happy to take your question. Sorry to not take it in real time, uh, but looking forward to Ron's discussion. Thanks. Okay, so, so when you first sort of start to read this paper, at first it sounds like magic. You know, how can you have, we're sort of, as Brian pointed out, we're trained to think that as you increase the, the number of parameters, and you get to the situation where the number of parameters gets closer and closer to sort of the sample size, to this t, in terms of the out-of-sample prediction, everything, uh, everything blows up. And in fact, there's, there's a recent literature in the last few years in statistics that basically shows 
that it's actually a good idea if you care about out of sample uh, predictability, if you care about sort of mean squared error out of sample, it's actually good to have many more parameters and it's good to sort of pass this, what they'll refer to as this interpolation uh, boundary. Okay? And what this paper does is this paper basically comes into this literature and looks at an application for portfolio choice, specifically an application for timing. So they're focusing on sort of the, the sharp ratio and they show that yes, in general, we already know in the last few years that this is valuable, but in terms of finance, you actually can get improvements in, in sharp ratio. Okay. So in terms, of, in terms of the basic setting, as Brian pointed out, these S's, think of those as sort of signals or, or state variables. Uh, there are many, many of them, and there's a predictive model. It's a one stock, it's a one asset sort of, uh, uh, setting. I'm sure Brian and his co-author is probably working on sort of multi-asset settings as we speak or already have been working on. Now, uh, it's a one period ahead prediction, uh, prediction exercise. Uh, one small point, which I'll get to uh, later, they make some assumptions in order to sort of make the math work. And the math in this paper is sort of non-trivial. So I would read the math part only if you actually have a solid math background. Otherwise, I would just skip, skip that part. And it is actually a large part of the paper. Okay. Uh, so one, one assumption is that they assume here that the third moment of the error and also of sort of these state variables, uh, the mean is actually zero. And I'll sort of touch uh, on touch on that. It gives them sort of tractability, which is important. Uh, the other important sort of innovation in this type of literature is when you think about this beta, when you think about sort of what is the exposure to these sort of factors, you're going to assume that beta is random. And this beta being random, that brings in the ability to sort of use what is called ra random matrix theory. And that's what helps them to basically derive very, very clean analytical results on sort of on the mean, on the uh, second moment, and on the, on the sharp ratio as well. Now, what are they going to focus on? They're going to focus on out of sample sharp ratios and to see how these out of sample sharp ratios uh, perform. In terms of the estimator that they're going to use, they're going to use ridge regressions. But I think more broadly, think of this as representing one machine learning model. Uh, other machine learning models would probably yield very similar results. It's just that looking at these ridge regressions, they get a lot of analytical tractability. And they can actually, instead of starting to simulate 10 million simulations to convince us, they can actually show us analytically what, what the results uh, should look like. So look at sort of. Uh, ridge, look also at, at ridgeless, which is the limit when you take this uh, shrinkage parameter uh, to zero. Now, one small point to, to be careful, when you take the shrinkage parameter to zero, you're not back to, to OLS. Okay, so, so it's important to keep that in mind. It's not that you're running OLS, uh, but you are sort of shrinking by a very, very small amount that keeps on, that keeps on uh, shrinking. So let's first start with what we've always known. Okay, so what we've always known is what people in this literature refer to as sort of the classical domain. And when you, when you look at sort of mean squared error, that's going to be sort of the measure that we're going to predict out of sample, uh, out of sample success. Now, Brian and his co-authors are going to sort of separate this mean squared error a bit differently than the usual uh, bias variance. They're going to look at sort of the, the timing component and the timing leverage. And that's sort of relevant for the portfolio choice uh, setting, because in the portfolio choice setting, essentially the variable you're going to choose, given that it's only one, one uh, asset here, is essentially the, the leverage, how much leverage you're, uh, how much leverage you're taking. Okay? And what they're trying to predict with this timing portfolio, they're basically trying to predict, OK, what is the correct beta that I want to put in? Now, in the classical literature, you have this bias variance decomposition. And, and what we've always known is the following, you know, that as you increase the complexity, and think of the complexity at this point as sort of the number of parameters in your model relative to the size of the sample. So as you start increasing the, the complexity, you're going to get better in sample fit. But in terms of the out of sample mean squared error, initially it, it, it improves. But at some point, as you get to this interpolation boundary, it starts to blow up. And that's where all our intuition is, is coming from. Now what happens beyond this interpolation boundary? Well, this is what people in statistics basically refer to as double descent. Okay? So in the last few years or in, uh, or in recent years, what they've shown is that, yes, around this interpolation boundary, it blows up. But if you look at the mean squared error beyond that interpolation boundary, and you keep adding more and more parameters, 
Well, what happens is the mean squared error actually starts, uh, starts to decrease. Now, where is the decrease coming from? The decrease is coming mostly from being able to reduce the out-of-sample variance. Okay, so you're very close in terms of the, the expected mean. And in fact, as you're going to increase its parameters in some of these settings, the expected mean is going to go down. But you're able to reduce a lot of the out-of-sample uh, variance. And now they're going to take this sort of idea and they're going to sort of apply it to portfolio choice and they're going to get explicit expressions basically documenting the out-of-sample uh, behavior. Okay? So let's start with sort of the first result that, the, that they show. So the first result is that they look at sort of the R squares of these out-of-sample regressions and the norm of the beta. Think of the norm of the beta as sort of the, the, the leverage. Okay? The leverage is basically sort of the larger the betas, since they're estimating the beta, the larger the betas, and they're using this beta in their trading strategy, they're, the larger the betas, the more leverage you have. Naturally, it's going to imply that the strategy is going to be more, more volatile the larger the beta is. Okay? So what you see here is that you basically get this sort of double descent property, both for the uh, norm of the betas and also for the R squares. And you can get very negative R squares. Even though you can get very negative R squares, Brian and his co-authors show that even in those states, you're going to get positive sharp ratio. Now, keep in mind that this negative R square is just a reflection of a positive mean squared error. So, so the R squares and the mean squared error, they're sort of tightly linked. Given that we saw this sort of exploding upward pattern for the mean squared error, we're going to get this exploding down pattern for the, for the R squares. Okay. So now let's look at sort of the, the, the core of the result. So at first, they start with a setting where they say, well, let's assume that I actually have a fully specified model. Now, this fully specified model may have a lot of parameters. And for me to try to understand what happens as I increase the number of parameters, it's very important to increase both the number of parameters and the size of the sample. Okay? So, so they're going to increase both of them. And the idea is what happens when, as the number of parameters blows up and as the number of periods increases as well, let's assume that there's some constant ratio that these things are sort of uh, fixed at. And they're going to look at what happens to these different ratios. And these different ratios are going to capture basically the complexity of the model. The higher the ratio, the higher the complexity of, of the model. And that's what you have here on the x-axis. The C captures the complexity of the model. Okay? So first of all, the volatility is just a reflection of the, the variance. So, so the volatility is a reflection of variance through these betas. And you saw that basically this is what typically happens for the betas. Now what happens with the expected returns? Well, the, the dark blue line, that is what is referred to as the ridgeless regression. Okay? In the ridgeless case, as long as you're below the, the, the uh, boundary, you actually have an unbiased estimator. But as you get sort of beyond the boundary, it starts going down just like all the others. What I want you to notice here is that here, when you look at the sharp ratio, two things. One is it's important to see sharp ratio is always positive. So that's like a big plus in terms of, of the bottom line. The other thing is notice that here, the sharp ratios are actually decreasing as you increase the model complexity. Now let's look at the case where you have a misspecified model, where you know only some of the parameters. And let's see what happens there. First of all, the behavior of the volatility is fairly similar. Okay, so it has this double, double descent uh, property. Now let's look at the expected returns. Now, what are they varying here? And that's actually, I think, quite important. Notice that here on the x-axis, they don't have C. They don't have the ratio between the true parameters to the number of observations. They actually have a product of C times Q. Now, what is Q? Q, in some sense, is a, is a variable that measures how good is my sort of approximation relative to the real unknown model. Now, as I increase, of course, the quality of my approximation, in some sense, not surprisingly, the expected returns improve because I have a better model in, relative to the true model. And as a result, what you get is that generally, the sharp ratios are increasing uh, throughout the domain. Okay? So those are sort of the key results. And then they have a very nice sort of uh, empirical exercise where they validate the results. And there are sort of two very strong results, which I think the authors need to sort of think about in terms of trying to understand how the model is able to produce this magic, quote unquote. One is that the, the optimal strategy is almost always a long only strategy. Okay? So that's, that's one thing. The other is, which is even more puzzling, this machine learning algorithm is able to essentially predict when recessions are coming. So if you look at sort of 
14 out of 15 recessions, the model basically shrinks the trading strategy as you get just before the, the recession. At this point, the paper sort of documents this. I think it's very, it's very interesting, but I think the authors need to try to understand or try to sort of figure out, okay, what in the model is a actually enabling you to pick up these sort of uh, these, these recessions? Okay, so I have, have about four more minutes. I'll have sort of a couple of sort of, I'll have a few points on the theory, a few points on the analysis, and then one or two points on the, uh, on the exposition. In terms of the theory, if you do want to sort of think about this as sort of something that's applicative, I think one natural question is, what happens now if you have portfolio constraints? So in the current model, you don't have any constraints, for example, on, on your leverage. So I would sort of uh, try to push the authors to see what happens when you have constraints. Now, I don't think it's that easy to do, and why isn't it that easy to do? In the current setting, the way it works is they have a two-stage process. What do I mean a two-stage process? First, you estimate the betas, and then you use those betas, plug into the strategy, and look at your out-of-sample uh, sharp ratios for different ridge shrink parameters. And now you're going to vary this, these shrink, shrinkage parameters and find the optimal shrinkage, which gives you the best out-of-sample sharp ratio. Once you have constraints, you're not going to be able to do that. You're going to have to actually solve both these, these things uh, jointly. So that, that's the first uh, suggestion. Second sort of uh, question slash suggestion is, is you know, can you relax this restriction on the third moments? The typical literature that has looked at this double descent, at least the papers that I've sort of uh, read preparing this, uh, this uh, uh, discussion, they don't impose this, this restriction. In the current paper, it gives you tractability. The question is, can you actually uh, eliminate that? And the third point is, there's a recent paper that suggests not only a constant shrinkage, but actually having a weighted shrinkage. So I'd suggest trying that. Now, why, is, why I'm suggesting trying that? It's not that I think, oh, it's more complicated, maybe sort of it's nice to show. In that paper, they show that sometimes it's actually optimal to have a negative shrinkage. So if it's sometimes optimal to have a negative shrinkage, and what you care about is not necessarily a shock ratio, but the expected return, you actually want, might want to use a strategy that uses sort of this weighted, uh, weighted shrinkage. In terms of the analysis, going back to this sort of increasing Sharpe ratio, that graph holds C fixed. So that graph holds the complexity of the true model, that's P divided by T, holds it fixed at 10, and varies the fraction of the parameters that you know out of the real model. And in some sense, when you look at that, it's not surprising that you get that the expected returns are, are going up. And now, if you remember, when I showed you the graph of the true model, what happens to the sharp ratios, those sharp ratios actually decrease as you increase P. So what I would suggest is look at a setting where on the x-axis, you, you're increasing both C and Q at the same time. So the simple way to do it is just define C as Q times C max, for example, C max is this 10, and produce the same results. And, and I think an interesting question is, are you actually going to get the upward sloping sharp ratio that we see from the figure with the partial observations, or are you going to get something that's either nonlinear or downward sloping, which is driven by the increase in the number of parameters in the, uh, in the model? Next small suggestion, I would suggest that actually in all these graphs, to actually also show what is the sharp ratio, what's the, the, the mean, what's the volatility under the quote unquote optimal shrinkage parameter. So they, the theorem actually gives them that optimal shrinkage parameter. So they don't need to sort of do a lot of sort of simulations to find it. And I think it would be interesting to see where that lies on this, on this uh, domain. In terms of the empirical analysis, as, as I pointed out, it's very puzzling or I think it's very interesting to figure out, okay, why is it always positive? And more important, how is it able to actually sort of pick up these recessions before anybody else knows that there are these recessions? Uh, my time is essentially almost up, so just a couple of points on the, uh, on the exposition. The first part of the paper talks about things that have been sort of this section 4.1, this paper, that essentially, this part that essentially talks about what happens to the mean squared error. Uh, this is something that we already sort of, I didn't know, of course, before I read this, but, but the relevant people in the literature know. So I would suggest reducing that, that part. This way you get directly to the part that we as finance people care about. 
The second is, you know, they put a lot of emphasis on these rigid progressions. And I think in terms of the, the mathem mathematical sort of challenge and stuff, it, it's very interesting. But if you look at all the graphs that they have, and if you look at the performance of the Sharpe ratio, the ridgeless, the ridgeless, both when you have the full sample and when you have part of the sample, the ridgeless regression performs the worst. So I'm not sure that in terms of application, that's the shrinkage you want to sort of, uh, you want to look at. And as I pointed out, you know, this point with the third moment. So let me, uh, let me uh, conclude. I think it's a very elegant model. The bulk of the paper, even though in the presentation you didn't see any formulas, the bulk of the paper is actually sort of rigorously deriving these asymptotic sort of uh, results. It extends this double descent literature into a setting which we care about, which is the, 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 portfolio, the portfolio setting. Looks at both the fully specified and the misspecified setting. It highlights the virtues of these of these complexities. So what seems like magic, actually, after you, you think about it, actually uh, makes sense. And finally, it has a very nice empirical exercise. And as I said a couple of times, I think you want to try to see, now that you get this result that it predicts regressions, what in these machine learning models is able to sort of pick up these, uh, these transitions. Thanks a lot, Brian. And first of all, I, this, I read this paper a couple of times. It's had a huge impact in my thinking, because I'm from the old school of Occam's razor. So. And I know my circle's the same way. So you've, before I potentially you know, critique or ask questions, it's just congratulations, this is a great paper. Thank you. Um, two, my two questions, one's, one's intuitive and one's empirical. So theory seems, uh, it's hard for me to put poke holes in theory, but like um, when you think about it, suppose the model is very simple. So let's just say you're doing like an intraday timing model where RT plus one is equal to 0.5 RT. It strikes me as hard pressed to think that you're throwing all this kitchen sink stuff that you're gonna do better. So what you're gonna need to do is say you're gonna detect that using that kind of complexity. So that's, that's point one. Point two more empirically, your, your results on this one, and I read the subsequent paper too, you start with a timing, an equity market timing model, which is, Everybody, a lot of people who try to do that know that that's really hard to do. And it's not surprising there's a lot of complexity. And you start with a 0.3 sharp where you use a set of factors that have been shown empirically to marginally work, mm -hmm. right? And then you improve the 0.3 to 0.5 or 0.6 or whatever. So many of us who do like quant investing would probably not put too much weight in a 0.3 back tested model. So what you're saying is you're taking a relatively weak exercise, which is forecasting equity markets, mm -hmm. and improving them. So suppose you started with a model where some of us might find like a one or a one and a half sharp in a back test. Would you still expect to see the same types of improvements? There is a lot of improvements from starting from a relatively poor point of view. Right. OK, so great questions. Um, first on the theory point, one thing is true. If you know the true model, then the virtue of complexity does not give you this generally increasing Sharpe ratio. That was actually the plot that Ron was showing where the Sharpe ratio slopes down. That's when you know the true model. You have a correctly specified model. That's when you see sort of results like that. My point. It's worse when you get to the same answer. So, so in some sense, there's no, there are no like real world comparative statics there. If you know the true model and the true model is simple, that's the Sharpe ratio you're going to get. If you know the true model and the true model is complex, that's the other Sharpe ratio you're going to get. There are two different worlds. They can't be compared to each other. All right, so your question is about, should I go through all of this virtue of complexity machinery if I think the model is simple? And the answer is yes, because it could be that log x forecasts returns. But unless you know to specify it as log x, the best thing you can do is use a nonlinear approximation of log x. All right, that's the way you should. It's not about sort of the, the complexity of the model. Once you move into nonlinearity, that's almost like saying the true model instantaneously jumps to infinitely complex. All right, okay. Now, it would be the case that if the true model happened to be linear, you go through sort of an inefficient process of trying to learn a linear model with this nonlinear expansion. That might be what you would have to do. I don't think the real world's linear, so I'm not too worried about, about that case. But regardless, the true model could be a simple nonlinear mo model 
And if we're honest that we don't know that relationship, big model's gonna help us approximate it. All right, now going to, to the empirical question, I actually think these, these are kind of related. Um, so keep in mind that the benchmark for these big nonlinear approximations is a linear model. Linear models are first order approximations. First order approximations are the most important approximations. So how important, this is something that I, I'll talk to clients a lot about. When you're trying to set people's expectations of what you're gonna get out of machine learning, you shouldn't expect revolutionary performance from machine learning. You should expect second and third order improvements because the first order models we use, they're good. They leave some predictability on the table because there are those nonlinearities that we can exploit but you should not expect it to double or triple your Sharpe ratio. I think seeing something like a 20% increase in a Sharpe ratio from introducing nonlinearities, like that, I, that just kind of feels realistic to me, right? Um, so that's how I think about, about magnitudes here, right? Now, why is it that we started in the market timing problem in the first place? It was because, and I gotta give Ron a ton of credit for going through and actually detailing some of the technical complexities of what we're doing. In 15 minutes, that was amazing. But trying to explain this to people in a big multivariate system where you might have more realistic settings is hard. So we wanted to deliver the first message in a single market timing framework because it's the simplest and most transparent way to see this stuff. You alluded to this other paper where we expanded to other assets. Those are still timing basic, basically problems. But in a soon to be circulated paper that we call complexity in the cross section, now we're looking at the panel problem. Panel problem's exciting because if we know that there's a place where there's a good chance that machine learning is going to help, it's going to be in the cross section of, of markets with lots of assets like stock. Right? And so that's, that paper is basically written. We're putting the final touches on it. You'll see it soon. Great. Thank you. Uh, excellent uh, presentation. You appear to be at the frontier of uh, machine learning and investments, but was any consideration given to the added cost of, say, doing machine learning versus uh, OLS regressions uh, and the time that's involved versus the uh, potential incremental return? Yeah, okay, so in the real world, computing costs are non-trivial, so it's an excellent point. Um, I want to, this is a great question, it gives me an opportunity to highlight an aspect of what we're doing here. So usually when people use these nonlinear models, they're not doing what I did. They actually estimate a full-blown neural network, all right? Think about that as the can canonical way that you're actually going to implement machine learning. What we're doing in this paper is saying, listen, use ridge regression. Ridge regression with generated nonlinear features is a neural network. You can essentially do a neural network training via ridge regression, at the cost of ridge regression. It's still a big ridge regression because you have to have like 10,000 predictors, but that's way, way, way cheaper than training the corresponding ne neural network in its, in its fullness, right? So in terms of computing costs, yes, it's non-trivial even when you're doing ridge regression, but it is a tiny fraction of the computing cost if you were training the entire neural network. And I blew by it on one of my last slides, but I alluded to this deep, essentially iterated virtue of complexity ridge regression framework. It stacks ridge regressions on top of each other, and it is a very cheap way to do a deep neural network, right? So one thing that we're very cognizant of, and actually it's something that we're excited about for the finance industry, if you go to Silicon Valley, you say, listen, I have a ridge regression way for you to estimate neural networks. They say, I don't care, I can estimate the neural network like that. But if you talk to a finance crowd, they say, it's a real nightmare to estimate neural networks. I would love to be able to do this with simpler tools. And so that's part of the effort behind this whole research agenda is to deliver those tools in a frame that's kind of accessible to most people in this type of audience. I um, come from the same old school era as uh, Ray. Me too. Uh, but um, I think we've always known that no matter you know, what the approaches are that we've applied in the past, there are definitely nonlinearities. I just don't think anyone really had a good way to go about the nonlinearities. And I think in the past, people tr were trying to specify nonlinear models. And so that's as flawed with all sorts of issues. 
as trying to figure out which exact variables you need to throw in there. So is the intuition behind all of this, we know the world is nonlinear, but instead of trying to find a nonlinear function, we're gonna take a lot of the inputs we've been using, and so instead of just throwing all of these inputs in a linear model, we're gonna make a lot of derivations of those inputs. So trying to think about it, value exposures, growth exposures, and whatever, I'm gonna build functions around that. Maybe some of those are conditional on different market environments or different sectors, and now I got a much broader range of information that is gonna allow me to better approximate an unknown, non-linear um, connection here, and, and is that ultimately what you're trying to achieve? Yes, so that is the motivation. Okay, so I'm gonna connect this to with Ray's comment. So Ray said, you know, if I know if it's a simpler, simple non-linear model, let's say that it's a log prediction function or something, right? I could specify that model and estimate it. And if I'm right, I've just nailed it. <laughs> but I'm not gonna be right. So then what do I do? Well, what you do is you use generic approximating models. And this is not our idea. This is a very old idea called nonparametric statistics, where I say that I think there's a nonlinear function there. I know that I could use a rich set of essentially terms in a big additive regression-like way to approximate whatever that function is. I don't have to know anything about it. That's the rationale behind what we're doing, but it's also the rationale behind all of machine learning in some sense. It is the ra rationale for why a good starting point is always gonna be something like a neural network. Because a neural network is not really specifying a nonlinearity, it's basically a nonparametric model. It says I can shape my estimates to fit any kind of wild curve you throw at me. Right? So that, yeah, that's the rationale, what I would say, for why we wanna be doing machine learning in the first place. I forgot to ask one follow-up, and I don't know if Andrea is still around, but yes. on the back of this, has AQR changed its approach to how you're building models? I think so. So, I mean, Chris gave uh, the introduction, but I run our machine learning effort at AQR, which I think is just a revelation of the fact that AQR is investing in this approach to, to, to thinking about building trading strategies, building portfolios for clients. Let me, let me um, borrow the mic from uh, Ingrid. And I have a, a, I'm not sure how equivalent um, facial Last recognition one. is necessarily to some of the financial problems we have, but I have sort of a thought experiment. And would this be possible for you to do? It, focusing more on the empirical side of your work, would it be possible to take all of your sort of parameters, all of your estimates, all of your data, your very detailed estimation that you sort of sort of um, didn't have time to discuss, put it in a vault at the Jacobs Levy Center at the Wharton School so that in 15 years from now or 20 years from now, it can be pulled out of the vault. Someone can take those results and your estimations and see how they did truly out of sample because you were concerned about is this truly out of sample. In other words, create an experiment where there truly can be an out of sample um, test. And secondly, do you think in this test we might discover the analogous of something we might call a complexity crash? Just like we talked about momentum crashes, could there be a crash, you think, because of complexity? Okay, interesting question. Um, I like the thought experiment, but the only way I have to answer the speculative question is to turn to the math. So I could think about, are there ways that I could write down some behavior of a world where if I do this, I'm gonna be bound for an eventual disaster? I suppose I could cook something like that up. It would probably have to involve some fairly extreme forms of non-stationarity, um, which I think it's interesting to be thinking about non-stationarity in conjunction with these complex models, especially given the fact that I'm using a 12-month estimation window, which sort of helps immunize me to some extent against non-stationarity because I lean less on more historical data. But it's an interesting question, great thought experiment. I don't have a very, a very well-formulated answer. I, well, thank you. We got to cut it, right? All right. Thank you all.